very happy to be here. Um, uh, this is a very dear place uh, to my heart. Uh, my wife is from here, and um, I'm really excited for the conference that is going to happen in just two weeks. Amen. Um, last year, I released a book called Break Free. I, I didn't bring it uh, with me this time. I'll just bring you with me to the conference and, uh, and stuff. So we'll make them available there. And um, whatever you can do, make your plans uh, to be at this conference. I believe that it will uh, shape, stretch, and something special. Even if you come here every single service, um, and you may say, well, I know the speakers, I watch them on YouTube and uh, this, the place, I know the worship team and everything. But there's something happens when you show up at the place where there's an expectation, where there's a prayer that's being offered. God moves in unusual ways. Amen. And plus many of you who are single and ready to mingle, you know, God can move in that way as well. Hey, hey amen. Amen, amen. Touch your neighbor, say, it could be your turn. Your mama's telling you to cannot miss the church for a reason. Amen. I am, from, um, I am from the part of Washington where it does not rain. I'm from the part of Washington where there's very little liberals and very little traffic. You may say that exists. Yes, it's called desert. <laughs> but uh, the Lord is moving uh, in our area and uh, slowly but surely uh, touching people's lives and supernaturally bringing people from uh, from other places to move to Tri-Cities because of um, because of the church and so I'm really really excited uh, to be alive and in this time and in this season of our generation. I want to speak with you uh, this evening about six marks of being filled with the Holy Spirit or a mark of a spirit-filled life. We're Pentecostal hashtag charismatic charismaniacs here most of us or get accused of being charismatics um, nobody really defines those terms for us now and a lot of times for us as people who are tongue speaking love the Holy Spirit uh, love the shaking and the baking love all of the good stuff people falling slain in the Holy Spirit you know we, we love the Holy Spirit we love the manifestation a lot of times people equal spirit-filled life to how loud someone can speak in tongues and though I believe we all should speak in tongues very loud because a quiet church is a dead church uh, sil <laughs> silence dominates cemeteries noise dominates hospitals where babies are born amen and for those of you who maybe are saying, oh, just you don't understand, I'm more of a reserved. I watch your Instagram stories, how you watch football. <laughs> and when the grandma is in front of you in the highway, your reservation goes outside of the window. And the only place you're reserved is in the church. The devil is a liar. We got to shake that off. Come on, somebody. It's not about volume, but there has to be life. There has to be life. But spirit-filled life is more than speaking in tongues. Spirit-filled, I'm not talking about spirit-filled prayer. Spirit-filled life is more even than us associating ourselves to a Pentecostal church. Spirit-filled life is more than falling when the preacher pushes you. I didn't say touches, I said pushes you because most of the time right now it's pushing, not touching. And spirit-filled life is way more than that. And I want to speak today about that because I believe what's lacking in our generation today is spirit-filled believers. What's going to change this world is spirit-filled people. What's going to be the solution to the dilemma in our generation is going to be spirit-filled people. Knowledge-filled people are not going to change the world. Degrees-filled people are not going to change the world. Some of you have more degrees than a thermometer, but that's not going to change your world. And degrees are important. Knowledge is very important. College is very important. Having a bachelor's and master's and every other degree you can get is extremely important. But when Jesus was about to send unqualified, uneducated people to the, the most dangerous parts of the world, he did not say go to a cement, uh, seminary. I keep mispronouncing cemetery and seminary. So <laughs> sometimes they're the same. Sometimes, not in all places. I am again not dissing on, on the importance of schooling and everything but Jesus said to wait for the Holy Spirit 
and without having a lot of degrees, without having a lot of connections, without having political connections, without having great fundraising abilities, without having a building, without having eloquence of speech, without having all the administrational abilities, this 120 people who just few days ago denounced Jesus and ran from him, not only they shook Jerusalem. They shook the most powerful empire on this world, the Roman Empire, until the gospel of Jesus Christ filled so much every city that their critics were saying, you are filling our cities with the doctrine of Jesus Christ. What did that? Holy Spirit Amen. in the life of those people. Christianity today has developed a new trinity. It's called God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Spirit has been pushed aside. And instead of that, the Holy Scriptures have become God. The Holy Scriptures are very important. It's the foundation of our faith. But I wrote a book last year and I can tell you one thing. An author is always bigger than the book. The Holy Spirit is the most important person on this earth today. And he doesn't just want us to know him as a doctrine. He doesn't want us to know him as just the third person of the Trinity. He wants us to be filled with him and not just to be filled with him when we receive the gift of speaking in tongues, but walk our life, Christian life, being filled with the Holy Spirit regularly and consistently until it makes an impact on the world around us and changes us from who we are to someone who is filled with the Spirit of the living God. Amen. I understand I'm preaching to the choir. I understand most of you this is not new information and, and if you are here today to receive new information let me disappoint you right away. It's not the new information that you need. We just need a fresh revelation of the same information our head is swollen with. The sun is not new every day. It's the same sun but it's still hot and we need it every single day. And I pray to the dear Holy Spirit that He will begin to quicken our hearts today for the things that we already know, that they go from our head to our heart and that we live those things instead of accumulate them just in our mind. The story I will take as a foundation for this message is the story of King Saul. I want to just create pretty much a check mark today for myself and for you. A six checks or six questions that I would like to ask you and I would like the Holy Spirit to examine your heart. That you check yourself that I check myself whether I am full walking in the fullness of the Spirit of God. If you have a Bible or if you have a phone, um, open uh, your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 11 verse 6 and verse 7. Or open your YouVersion Bible app to 1 Samuel chapter 11 verse 6 and verse 7. Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news and his anger was greatly aroused. And he took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers saying, Whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people and they came out with one consent. If we skip about five verses down to verse 12 and verse 13, the victory has taken a place. Then the people said to Samuel, who is he who said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring these men that we may put him to death. But Saul said, not a man shall be put to death this day. For the Lord has, has accomplished a salvation in Israel. This is the chapter that is pretty much the best chapter in Saul's life. After this chapter, everything goes down for King Saul. He um, loses the anointing, he loses the intimacy with the Holy Spirit and he gets some demons and he develops mental disorder. He starts killing people who want him and love him and, and pretty much he just loses it and then at the end he um, dies very, very tragic death. But he didn't start like that. How he started is here in this first chapter and I want to examine from his life because all of these six things happen in your life and they happen in mine. The story starts like this. King Saul gets anointed to be a king. He's, after the anointing and inauguration was great, probably Israel couldn't pay his salary. So he goes back to his daddy's work, 
works with oxen, goes into farming, he's a king and one of the cities of Israel gets attacked by the enemy and the enemy instead of attacking the city they propose to make a covenant with the city and say this that if you come out and surrender that we will spare your life but instead we're going to take some fingers from your feet and from your hands and that city said you know what we would love to give up our fingers but before we do that let us call Saul and see what Saul has to say about this situation so somebody sent an Instagram direct message to King Saul's secretary. She forwarded the message to King Saul. He, heard, he hears the message that his people are about to be attacked and King Saul goes bananas. He goes crazy. The Bible says he gets angry. He's not passive. He becomes aggressive. He becomes brutal. He becomes ruthless. He becomes not normal. His veins just come up and he looks at the oxen that he's working with, kills the oxen, takes pieces, chops bloody pieces, puts it in UPS, USPS and FedEx and ships it to all 12 tribes of Israel and says, if you don't show up in three days, that's exactly what I'm going to do to your house and to your oxen. Three days. The clock starts now. So as you can imagine, everybody got a little bit scared. Everybody came together. King Saul, I think Samuel's looking, he's like, that's my boy right there. <laughs> a little crazy, but you know, I like it. <laughs> I like it. It's good. The boy's good. We made a good decision. We got a good king. <laughs> I mean, Holy Spirit moves on him a little bit weird. Kills things, but hey, it's good. At least he's not passive. And Samuel's like, I'm with you, bro. Let's, let's do it. The armies get together. Everybody comes together. There's a unity that's happening. Samuel doesn't even give him directions. Prophetic words don't flow. His soldier says, we're going to attack. And they're going to that city. And they surprise that enemy. They destroy the enemy. They bring salvation. They come back. And there were people who were hating on Saul. They didn't like the fact that, you know, he had no background in being a king. He didn't go to university. He didn't have this and that. So they were like, he's not going to be a good king. And so they come to Samuel and start to whisper, say, hey, can we bring the haters? And like stone them. Not like make them go on drugs, but like kill them. And, and Saul overhears the conversation. And I want you to notice, Saul interrupts the whole thing. He comes and he says, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not going to happen. He says, the haters, leave them alone. They don't like me? That's fine. Relax. Jeez, what, what is this? What are you, you going to go killing everybody who doesn't like you? Relax people. The Saul we see here is not the Saul you meet in the rest of the chapters of the Bible. I want you to notice the first mark of spirit-filled life. You fight your enemies instead of agreeing with your enemy. Write this down in your notes if you're taking notes. If you're spirit-filled, you will attack the enemy instead of agreeing with the enemy. You will attack the enemy instead of agreeing with the enemy. When you are spirit-filled, sin is not something that you will justify. It's something you will attack in your life. When you're spirit-filled, you will not make covenant with the enemy. When Saul was spirit-filled, he goes and fights the enemy. But I want you, let's, let's forward to when Saul is not walking with the Holy Spirit. I want you to, you guys remember the story of David and Goliath? Yes, not, yes, no. If you remember the story, say yes. Okay. You watch the movies? Been to Kid Zone? That whole story should have never happened. The reason why that story happened is because Saul was not walking with Holy Spirit. Who presented the challenge to fight one man against another? Saul or Goliath? Why did Saul agree to the terms of Goliath? In here, the enemy presented a challenge. Saul rejected that and said, I'm not here to make peace. I'm here to destroy you. When the anointing leaves his life, Goliath sets the rules and Saul follows them. Goliath says, one man has to fight me. 
and the outcome of one battle determines the outcome of war. Now it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out this challenge benefits only Goliath, nobody else. And there's everything wrong with this challenge because God never called one man to fight an enemy. He always called an army to fight the enemy. And Goliath first seeks to isolate people so he can fight them alone. He benefits from that. Secondly, the problem with that is that Goliath says an outcome of one battle determines the war. Everybody who's ever played any games knows one thing. You can lose a quarter and win a game. Anybody who's ever been in war knows you can have a bad day on the battlefield and still win a war. So here is Goliath lying through his teeth and Saul being an idiot. <laughs> okay. You want one man? Let me find a man. See that's exactly what happens when you don't walk in the Holy Spirit. What the devil says, you agree to it. The devil said, you're born gay? Uh -huh, yes I am. The devil says, you're born a liar. The devil says, that's who you are. That's going to be a part of your life. You're addicted to pornography. You can't overcome. Well maybe, maybe that is just who you are. The devil says it and you agree with it. Why? Because when you walk in the Holy Spirit, you disagree and you fight with the devil. You don't agree with the devil. Somebody say amen. I am not saying if you walk with Holy Spirit you don't have enemies. It does not mean you don't have battles. It does not mean you don't have struggles. It's just simple as something inside of you rises up and says that is not who I am. I might battle with you right now. I might struggle in this right now. I might even fall into this right now but that is not who I am. I am a child of God. I carry God's imprint inside of me and I will fight this, I will overcome this and I will rise above this. Somebody say Amen. Are you with me? I remember when I was meeting one man earlier in their ministry, it was my first encounter with somebody who, who lived a homosexual lifestyle. I invited him to that youth service. He was open gay, lived very very openly as a, um, as a gay man. And he came to the service and I preached about something about your issues, not your identity from the woman with an issue of blood. And then he comes to me afterwards and he says, Vlad, all my life I believe that I was born gay and that's the way I am. I said, you know what, you're probably right. I said, like, you probably were born gay. I'm, I'm like, I was born stupid. I'm like, I was born sinner. Jesus tells you and me to be born again. I'm like you need to be born again because the first time you were born it was not right and he said but honestly he said what changed my life is he says what today in this service is not the fact that God delivered from me from homosexuality he says for the first time I saw that uh, this these homosexual tendencies when I if I am a Christian these tendencies are not who I am these are my enemies that I can conquer with God but you can't conquer something if you agree with it. If you are like Saul and you agree to the terms of your Goliath, it's a first sign you're not filled with the Spirit of God. Because the only thing Holy Spirit agrees with is with this book. He doesn't agree with the lies. The devil will say you're ugly. The devil will say you got a pimple on your forehead that said you'll never get married. <laughs> The devil will say you got love, love handles, that's it. You know what, you're fat. The devil will say you have no calling because nobody asked you to preach and nobody invited you to the primary team. Listen, one thing about the devil, if his mouth is moving, he's lying. And if you agree to him, you, that's a first sign you're not walking with the Holy Spirit. When you walk with Holy Spirit, the first sign is this, is you don't feel comfortable with Goliath's lies. If Goliath gets up and says something, you, you may say, you know what, you big, you all this and that, but there's one thing I know, something in me just says, mm, 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 mm. no, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I know I've fallen into that sin already, but that is not who I am. That is not how God called me and I will overcome that. Why? Because God calls you to fight your enemy and without the Holy Spirit, you will live with your enemy. And when somebody comes and says, you know what? You know you can overcome that and you will fight them. Why? Because you and your enemy have cohabitated. That sin becomes part of you. You will justify it with the Holy Spirit. You will kill it. Without the Holy Spirit, you will agree to its terms. Some of you today, you're agreeing with your sin. 
You're cohabitating with your sin. You made a peace treaty with your sin for only one reason. It's because you and the Holy Spirit are not close. The first thing that's going to happen when you repent to God, the first thing that's going to happen is the very thing you agreed with. You will break the contract. You will break the agreement with that sin. You will break the agreement with that enemy. And you will say, me and you are not on the same page. Are you with me? I want you to notice the second thing is that King Saul, not only he fights the enemy when he's with the Holy Spirit and when he's not walking with the Holy Spirit, he agrees with the enemy. But the second thing that I want you to notice is that you will be courageous when you're with the Holy Spirit and you will be a coward when you're without the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit, boldness was released into Saul. Without the anointing, Saul was balanced cautious and played safe. I want you to hear this again. With the Holy Spirit he was reckless and without balance. Without the Holy Spirit he was balanced, cautious and played safe. I know that being balanced, cautious and playing safe is the wisdom but it's also a sign that you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. When was the last time you lost your balance? Because if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, balance goes out of the way. You become bold. Jesus wasn't balanced when he was dying on the cross. That's not what balanced people do. Disciples, they, when they get crucified upside down, it wasn't a balanced life. <laughs> and the Pharisees, when they looked at disciples, after they healed a man, they did not say, we notice balance in your life. You're so well-rounded, cautious. You play so safe, blameless. We can't even charge you with anything. When they looked at disciples, they said this about them. They said, we notice you don't have education but there's boldness because you've been with Jesus. If you are with the Holy Spirit, you gain boldness. It doesn't mean that you become stupid. It doesn't mean that you get up on the lunch table and you start screaming in tongues and then you get kicked out of school. I'm not talking about that kind of outside balance. I'm not saying that like one of my uh, friends wanted to get his mom saved during the winter and he took a bucket of oil, poured it on the driver, it was a slippery and they froze it and his mom fell and broke her neck. I'm not talking about that out of balance. But I'm talking about when your life is lived, not calculated, not cautious, not I, 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 wanna, I wanna be playing safe. But when, your, when the Spirit of God fills your life, there's boldness and courage that's released not caution. So many people are living cautious, calculated and play it safe. For some of you even who are in the internship right now, it was a bold move. For some of you to begin to step into your calling will require boldness but when you get close to the Holy Spirit, boldness will have to be one of the marks that will mark your life. You may say, but by nature I am not a very bold person. Holy Spirit will change your nature. You may say, but by nature I am very shy. Well, you're looking at the most shy person in this room. By nature, I am not very the one who takes a risk. Like even financially, I am Dave Ramsey's disciple. The whole idea of giving up my finances for the kingdom of God, that is not balanced. But I can tell you one thing, when you become a disciple of the Spirit of God, there is going to be a balance that will mark your life. Okay, so let's do this. We either clap or we don't. Because <laughs> I'm like golf clap. Yeah, so, so when somebody starts clapping, we all go together. Just, just encourage the brother. Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> you know, I was the most balanced. I felt like I was the most balanced person. I was so balanced in the area of healing that I didn't believe in it. <laughs> I remember I listened to so many good. Oh, all right, all right. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, well, let me correct myself. I was so balanced in the area of healing that I didn't pray for healing. Because I, I knew God might not heal and so I wanted to be balanced. 
when it came to uh, finances you know I saved I, I gave 10% but I also wanted to be very balanced I heard these people who give you know all of their money away I'm like man that is not balanced that is not that is not calculated that is not caution that is not me that's not even wise because the woman a widow who gave her last might Jesus didn't come and say a oh, woman that, that is not wise you need a little Dave Ramsey classes what are you doing all of giving all of your money away and when Jesus looked at the rich ruler and he says sell everything that you get and give it to the poor that is not balanced what I want to tell you is this if the Savior you follow when you follow him closely one thing in your life that will have to go on the altar is cautious playing safe and a balanced life and one thing that is going to be produced is a radical committed fully surrendered life for Jesus Christ with God there is no half and half you can't sit on a fence and have one leg here and one leg there and I'm not trying to encourage you to do something radical I say come to the Holy Spirit let him fill you and radical will become byproduct giving fasting praying and doing things that you will look at yourself and say that is not me that's not my personality that is not how I am wired it's outside of my comfort zone why because the Holy Spirit leads us to being courageous King Saul on the day of his inauguration the guy was so good looking the Bible says he was taller than anybody else even Samuel says on whom is the desire of all Israel but not you the guy was good looking on the day of his inauguration he was hiding behind bags the Bible says he hid on the day of his inauguration behind bags because he was so shy but when he hears the news that some of his people are being attacked boldness rises up lack of boldness is a sign that you have the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit just doesn't have you a calculated safe life is a sign you're not filled with Holy Spirit I am not saying you're not a Christian. I'm not saying you're not a good Christian. Because when you get filled with Holy Spirit, there's boldness. I am not saying that you will feel bold. It's the Holy Spirit makes you courageous. He helps you to invite people when you don't feel like inviting people. He will give you words for people. He will help you to step out of, I'll be honest with you, I am the first guy to admit speaking in front of people is the scariest thing for me less less scary right now but before when I was a teenager so on this like last aisle there's maybe like 20 or 15 people sitting there I was so shy of people I was skipping a keyboarding class in my ninth year in, as a freshman in high school because I was shy and scared of standing in front of a group of 20 students to do one minute and 30 second presentation about where we came from and where we were born I was so scared of people I was so shy of the stage the first sermon I preached I was 12 years of age five minutes before the sermon it was freezing cold in Ukraine my whole shirt my sweater was drenched in sweat I sweated all through my pants that's five minutes before the sermon I had that sermon memorized from the back of my head when I got up there I was so hot I forgot everything I was so shy and I was so scared and so when I was challenged to preach I said this is the most uncomfortable for me I'm not meant plus like my physical appearance is not most attractive for the stage I don't belong there God but you have to understand God doesn't consult your appearance your opinion and your fears when he calls you when he fills you he gives you boldness somebody give God some praise right now somebody give God some praise right now it's time to walk in boldness it's time to walk in courage can somebody say amen be courageous walking with Holy Spirit makes you bold it makes you look at the sick people and pray for them invite the lost it makes you do what you are not maybe comfortable doing it makes you look at your finances and say you know what I'm never in my life I remember when we did that with our finances and we decided to to give boldly not like you know just, just, just a little bit but in a way that you can't forget in a way that afterwards you're singing my domlani bisach kind of like stuff you, you, you're singing Jesus my home is in heaven kind of a thing in a way that kind of messes with you just a little bit when you're bold God releases miracles 
Can somebody say amen? Being full with Holy Spirit makes me attack my sin instead of agreeing with my sin. It makes me courageous instead of being a coward. Number three, it will make you serve people instead of fearing them. It will make you serve people instead of fearing them. When the Holy Spirit came upon Saul, fear of God came upon people. When the Holy Spirit left Saul, fear of people came upon Saul. Let me say that again. When the Holy Spirit came upon Saul, Pastor Slavik, I was intrigued that Saul became so courageous. He started to do radical things and it doesn't say that the fear of Saul came upon people. Like if a pastor today would do this, like he would take his own car in the parking lot and burn his car down and take all the burnt parts and ship it to the main leaders of his church and say, if you don't show up to pray and fast for three days, I'm going to do that to your cars. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I will have a fear of that pastor upon me <laughs> for three days. <laughs> I will either move from Vancouver or, or I will quickly come be there praying. And you would think when Saul did that, it would say the fear of Saul came upon people, but it doesn't say that. It says the fear of God came upon people. Because see, when the radical action are fueled by the Holy Spirit, people are not going to be afraid of you. People become afraid of God. Not in the negative sense. But I want you to see this. King Saul was fearless of people. When the anointing was there people actually loved him they gathered together this was the only time when the whole Israel got together under his leadership all other times Israel was never together with him when the anointing was there when the Spirit of God was there let's forward to chapters after that when Saul offers unlawful sacrifice and Samuel comes and says you what you did was foolish what was Saul's excuse what did he say to Samuel? He said, people. When he didn't kill Amalekites and God told him to do that, what did he say? People. Every single time after the anointing left his life, he didn't fear the devil. He had a fear of people that gripped his life. The people he was anointed to serve became the people he lived to please. And they ruined his life the people are good when you serve them they will destroy you when you seek to please them without the holy spirit you will become a people pleaser you will live your life for their approval and you will die in your life from their rejection you'll be a butt kisser let me just put it 21st century for you because I see some of you are not getting it. You will just walk around on eggshells. When the Holy Spirit is on you, it's not that you're rude. I'm not talking about that you're mean. I'm not, I'm not saying you're, you're a jerk or you're walking around just being, being harsh, a dictator or some, some dominator. I'm not talking about that. But when it's done with the Holy Spirit, even when you're strong and authoritative, people have a fear of God. When there is no Holy Spirit, it's all lovey-dovey. It's as though you're seeking to love them, but behind it is a fear of people. Fear of losing people. What will they think of me? I genuinely believe that Jesus did not die on the cross because he loved people. In fact, when he was talking to Nicodemus, he didn't say, Nicodemus, for I so love the world that I came to die for it. What did he say? For God loved the world that he sent me. When he was dying, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, you don't see Jesus praying this prayer. Father, get the cup of suffering close. Why? Can't wait to drink it. No. He says, Father, get the cup away from me if possible. Why? I don't want to drink it. I don't want to paint a picture for you that Jesus did not love you. That's why he, he didn't die on the cross because he loved you. But I want you to think realistically. You and I, he was just like us. And what motivated him to go on the cross, it was not love of people. It was love for the Father. I know we say, I was on his mind. I, I'm sorry to burst your bubble. His Father was on his mind. Why? If you ever want to last in ministry, people cannot be the motivator. Because people are like what Matthew Burnett said on this stage. He said, you want to be a bridge to a dying world? You have to be ready to be walked upon. People will hurt you. 
people will reject you people will talk about you underappreciate you all the bad stuff that you can think of they'll do and a little bit more on the top and the only way you will live your life loving those people is because you're first sold out to Jesus Christ everybody started their ministry like that but with time we are like King Saul we drift from walking before the Lord and serving the people to walking before people and pleasing the people and realizing it's never enough it will never be enough and when people become the primary motivation of why you do what you do you will never fulfill the call of God on your life and you realize it's a first sign that the Spirit of God is not filling your life Spirit of God fills your life to serve people not to please them if you live your life pleasing people doing what you want you're a tail not the head Henry Ford said this if I would follow people's advice I wouldn't give them a car I would give them a faster horse people wanted a faster horse I didn't follow people's advice I followed my vision as leaders as home group leaders as ministers in this room as people who are filled with Holy Spirit I want to challenge you to tell you this do not flow only dead fish flows with the current I am not saying we, we should reject people and not serve people but as Christians our first allegiance is to our Savior and to the Holy Spirit and when we are filled with Holy Spirit we will lead our generation further in God actually we will love people more than if we seek to please them in reality when you seek to please people you don't love people you are insecure and you love yourself and you're using people to build and fix your insecurity you don't care about people you're just using them like a napkin because in reality you're in love with the fact that you've broken on inside and you want to use their opinion to fix that brokenness but only Holy Spirit can fill that brokenness He can fill that brokenness He can fix that brokenness and actually give you genuine unadulterated purely motivated love for those people Amen Being filled with Holy Spirit helps me to serve people instead of pleasing them when you serve them you're free not to please them your friends social media what the world thinks of you that fear gets gone when you are filled with Holy Spirit when you are not filled with Holy Spirit you're imprisoned by their opinions everybody is very cool in high school 10 years later most of them are extremely overweight their parents already took their cars away the ones that they were showing off with at school all the brand clothes they can't afford now to pay for child support because they have children in different nations from different countries and you quickly find out everyone who was cool in high school is a fool after high school and opinions of people that you were so imprisoned by you matter to be included in that in that little clique and that little club and today you can't even remember their names I remember when I was in high school I, I had a minivan this is the one I could afford $300 and my dad got it from some kind of an auction and so I drove it they called me, they called me family man they called me all kinds of names at school <laughs> you know but the beautiful part was this I know that I knew that I wasn't good looking like I knew that it was it wasn't like a revelation okay it was pretty obvious <laughs> secondly I knew that I wasn't athletic and I didn't have musical abilities so I already lost the game of winning somebody's approval like I already before even the, the, the game I already lost I got disqualified so what gave me freedom is this I never had to live for their approval because I knew I'll never get it it made my life so much easier I see them over there flashing and trying to improve and impress you know going to a prom and I'm like my church believes not going to the prom I don't even have to win nobody's approval because I'm not even going to that prom I don't no girl's gonna go with me why because first I'm not going there why because I'm a Christian period <laughs> it made my life so much easier yes did people have opinions all the time I see opinions are like feet everybody has them and sometimes they stink and last time I checked, you can't fill your car's gas with someone's opinion. Go to the gas station after the service and try to use their opinion to put gas in your car. If it doesn't help you to fill your car with gas, it shouldn't fill your mind with anything. Their opinion is their opinion. So years later, 
I graduated, you know, and because I didn't live my life competing for their attention, I didn't wear nice stuff. I always wore things from Goodwill or Valley Village. Valley Village now got closed down, but Goodwill still exists there. And so I, I wore simple stuff just, just because it never bothered to impress anybody. I knew that I want to lose at that game. Plus, who cares who's popular in high school? It's not like it's going to matter in life. I'm 22, 23, and those cool kids who made fun of me, who threw papers, put them together and threw it at my face in the classroom. I had one of the properties I was renting out and I saw one cool kid pulled in and on this like long boat, like it's not a boat, it's just an old beaten up car. I saw it and it's like, boo, 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 make, make that. It wasn't the cool noise, it was just broken up car. And I see him coming out and no disrespect to, to people who are pleasantly plumb, but he, he was extremely pleasantly plumb. He comes out and I was like, is that? I'm like, that's you! From, 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 you, you're the big football player. He's like, and that's, and he was about to say, he's like, are you the manager? I was like, well, I'm kind of, you know, own this place. Nah, I can't. You own the place? He's like, wow. And I was like, you drive that? And he looked at my car in the driveway. He said, that's yours? I'm like one of them. We looked at the place. <laughs> We looked at the place. I looked at his uh, looked at his application, and I said, "I'm so sorry, but I can't take you." I'm like, "You're a mess." He's like, "We're bros. We go back." I was like, "Yeah, of course we do. You threw papers at me. We go back." I was like, "I can put you in prison right now for harassing me and bullying me." And so I rejected his application. He kept texting me and and everything. And then I drove back home, and I was like, "Man, I'm so happy I didn't fight for people's approval in high school." That approval, <laughs> there's more use of toilet paper than their approval in your life. But the real reason why you're fishing for their approval is because you're not filled with Holy Spirit. When you're filled with Holy Spirit, you don't need their approval. You love them, you serve them, and you feel bad for them. I just want to encourage all the young people, when you hit 30, the things that you battle with right now, they're not going to matter. But the only way you can get through these battles is if you walk in fullness of the Holy Spirit. You may say, but you don't understand. I don't like it the way I look. I didn't either. When you get filled with Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit helps you to look less at that mirror and more <laughs> at this one. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. Number four. When you are filled with Holy Spirit, you will fight alongside of the authority instead of always being frustrated with the authority. When Holy Spirit came upon Saul, he went to war with Samuel. Without the Holy Spirit, him and Samuel had constant frictions. When the Holy Spirit was upon Saul, I want you to see that him and Saul were like partners. Samuel, excuse me, uh, uh, him and Samuel. Samuel was his, like his partner in battle. Samuel, he even said this, we've read it. It's, he said that, he says, if somebody doesn't go with me and Samuel, I want you to see that Saul and Samuel were close. They had a good relationship. Samuel wasn't bossy. Somehow Samuel was good. After the Spirit of God lifts from Saul's life, now he has a problem with Samuel. Samuel demands too much. Samuel is this and that. Samuel sends me on some weird mission. Samuel told me that I have to wait for him seven days. And him and Samuel have frictions to the point that one time he, he actually grabs hold of Samuel's robe and he rips it from him. And Samuel rebukes him and you see the friction between him and authority. What I'm about to share might be a little bit painful for some of you. I genuinely believe if you're filled with Holy Spirit, there is going to be honor for authority. Even if your authority is not honorable. When you're not filled with Holy Spirit, one of the things that you will have always in your life is problem with authority figures. Parents, pastors, teachers, ladies, men, anyone who represents authority inside of you, you get sick about it. Something is going to be always wrong with you and authority. And you will of course blame it on them. You'll say, oh, it's them. They're controlling, manipulative, religious. They're this and that. But in reality, could it be 
that there is an absence of the presence of God in your life. The Holy Spirit fills you and one of the things He will do in your life, He will give you respect for authority. He will say, what if my father is not worthy of that respect? Where there in the Bible it says, honor your father and your mother unless they're worthy of it? Where does in the Bible it say, honor your pastors, follow your leaders unless you don't like them? Do you think Jesus felt at 12 years of age when he was God at 12 years of age? Now I understand at 12 years of age most of us think that divinity wakes up in us and we become God. But he was actually God at 12 years of age and his mom and dad and came and says, Jesus, uh, this whole thing that you're talking to the pastors and talking about the saving of the world, um, could you stop that? Why We, we have a business to run. And Jesus says, um, I, I must be about my father's business. And that's, excuse me, did you forget what your business is? Your business is with me, boy. You come. And Jesus being God, he could have looked at him and said, Joseph, I know every bone that's structured in your body right now. Every vessel. The only thing I have to do is blink and you're going to stop breathing. Joseph, I created you. I fashioned you in your mother's womb. Who do you think you are? How do you talk to your God? <laughs> do you know what Jesus says? The Bible says he humbled himself and says, okay, dad. <laughs> okay, we'll go. All right, all right. If God submitted himself to earthly parents, who do you think you are? That you're rebelling against yours. But my parents are unreasonable. They put a curfew on me. That doesn't make them witch doctors. Yeah, I was a youth pastor. My parents had a curfew on me. 9.30. You know how embarrassing it was on the youth night telling the youth people, we got to finish up. Why? I got to be home. Why? My parents told me to be home by 9.30. What kind of a youth pastor are you? They said. You still live with your parents? Shame on you, I heard people say. And I said, my Bible says to leave your parents when you have someone to cleave. It does not say to leave your parents when you turn 18. Oh my God, did you just say that? Yeah. And most of you, this is what's going to happen. You're going to move at 18 out of your parents' house to be independent, pretty much to sin. Another word for that. And then when you get married, you move back at your parents' house. Why? Because you broke. Mm-hmm. And Bible says it's not good for a man to live with his parents when he's married. Our generation is twisted. We move out at 18 and we move back in when we get married. So, so if for those of you who think it's popular and cool to follow the culture, I want to tell you something. The culture is messed up. The scripture is not. The same culture who protects dolphins in Florida kills babies even after they were tempted to be murdered. And so I don't follow the culture. And I looked at even some of the youth to follow. They say, you know, you, you're not my real youth pastor because you live with your parents. I say, I follow the Bible. And I said, I save money. <laughs> and I develop my character. And I break my pride. And I remember when my, my parents lifted the banner from 9.30 to 10.30. What a day it was. You may say, how dare they did that? They just didn't trust me. That's it. And then came a point where they trusted me to do whatever I wanted. I disappeared for three days, ended up in another state. And they called me. They're like, hey, we have, we've noticed your bed has not been occupied for the three days. Are you still here? Where are you? I say, oh, mom, I forgot. I'm in California. I'm just doing one of those services. She's like, oh, well, if you need any money, just let us know. And uh, we're just praying for you and we bless you. And I want to tell you this, is that when I moved out at 24, now you can call me whatever you want to call me. And your opinion right now does not matter. But I can tell you one thing, is that when I left my parents' house at the age of 24, I left with their blessing. Being filled with Holy Spirit causes you to honor your parents. For me, it was more important my parents' honor than what kids at the youth group taught of me. Because their opinion doesn't give me long life and it doesn't give me good life. My parents' blessing does. So I miss on opportunities. I didn't, couldn't hang out with everything. I couldn't wear what I wanted to wear because one time I remember I was going to the youth service and I dressed up in, you know, like these sweatpants, the, like the workout pants, workout pants. Yeah. I love, there was blue, like they were extra size, extra, big, big, bigger than me. And so, but I love them because they were so comfortable. I felt like T.G. Jakes walking them, like they were just, like big, you know, T.G. Jakes used to wear like big stuff. Some of you don't know what that is, but it's, it's fine. So they were just very big sport pants. And before I got married, I had no idea like how to dress up. Like I just, I, I, I wore whatever was comfortable. 
And so I remember I put these shiny Ukrainian shoes, you know those ones you buy in bazaar in Ukraine. And, and I, I put this sweatpants, so pretty much workout pants with the like Sunday shoes and a shirt and a, and a, and a Sunday shirt uh, over it. And so it was Thursday night, I'm going to the youth service, I grab my Bible and my dad, you know he doesn't understand much about style but he knows one thing, you don't go in the gym clothes to church. Well at least according to him. So he looks at me and he says, where are you going? I said, well dad, I'm a youth pastor, I'm going to church. He says, not in those pants. I said, yes, in those pants. <laughs> and so I looked at my dad like that, got into my car and I'm about to drive off. And before I drive off, I'm thinking, man, my dad, when is he going to like renew his mind that God looks at the heart, not at the clothes? <laughs> and I hear this still small voice from the Holy Spirit and he says, go change your pants. And I said, God, you said in your word, I'm going to actually quote you right here. Let me get you so in case you forgot. And I felt the Holy Spirit says, I know what I said. I also said, honor your father and your mother. And right now you're not honoring him. And I said, God, you don't understand. You know, my dad is religious. I don't have to honor him. I mean, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Plus, I'm the man of God on Thursday night. <laughs> That's why I needed to live with my parents because I was so messed up inside of my head. And I said, Lord, I'll do anything. I'll, I'll go and change my pants. But there's one thing that I cannot do. You know, Russian Ukrainian dads, they have this thing about them that when, when you go and change and you agree that you were wrong, they don't embrace you like the father did the prodigal son. It's like, come son, I know how hard it was hard for you. Come, cry on my shoulder. No, they, they have this thing where it's like, well, that's right, that's right, uh-huh. It's about, it's about time. You children learn rules in my house. Yep, yep, everybody gonna do what I said in this house. And I knew exactly this would be a moment for my dad to shine. And I honestly, I, I would have gave my whole heart, liver and, and everything inside of me just not to see my dad have this feeling like he conquered me. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And so I secretly prayed to God. I said, Lord, give my dad a diarrhea. <laughs> Let him go to the bathroom. I will change. I will put on a suit if you want me to, Lord. But just, I don't want to see my dad sit there and give this look. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, that's right. It's about time you learned how to obey your father in this house. So no, the Lord did not answer the prayer of his wicked servant. My dad did not have a diarrhea. He sat there on the couch and no, my dad did not embrace me like a prodigal son. He gave me that, that, that mean, self-righteous, judging, I, 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 uh, I conquer you kind of a look. And I was about to open my mouth and the Lord says, like a lamb led to the slaughter, keep walking, keep walking, keep walking. Don't mess up your miracle right now. I changed my pants. But honestly, that day I've learned something that has nothing to do about clothes. It has nothing to do about the religion of your parents. It has nothing to do about the rules. It has nothing to do about that. It has to do with one thing. There is pride inside of your heart. And when parents ask you for something you don't agree and like, you have to die. That's all. I felt the Holy Spirit spoke to me this. He says, it was never about the pants. I wanted you to die. He says, and until this situation happened, he says, you always do what they say and you agree with them. But this situation provoked your ego. It had nothing to do about the pants. It had to do with your ego and it had to do with your spoiled brat, pitiful pride. And I wanted to squash the like a bug and I couldn't wait until that would be exposed. If you're walking with Holy Spirit, your authority will have to be honored. The authority God gives you. If you have a problem with authority right now, not only you have to repent, but you have to get back to the Holy Spirit because Holy Spirit doesn't rebel against authority. If you walk in authority, you have to walk under authority. Amen. I want you to write down the next thing, being filled with Holy Spirit and we're finishing up in just a few more minutes. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, not only it helps me to walk in, a, in honor to my authority, my pastor, my parents, but it, it will, you will have mercy on your foes instead of attacking your friends meaning you will have mercy on your enemies when you walk with Holy Spirit but when you are walking not in the Holy Spirit you start attacking people who actually are for you could be your leaders could be your friends you become suspicious of people I want you to see King Saul so people don't believe in him 
people undermine him people talk behind his back remember they didn't come to him they came to Samuel he only overheard the conversation they were saying he's not good enough they're undermining him and Saul comes and interrupts the conversation and says guys Samuel don't even listen to this let him go give him a little gift what is this they don't believe in me I didn't even believe in myself but I want you to watch this when David was committed to Saul he loved Saul he gave his life to protect Saul and Saul would throw spears at him, spend most of his life chasing David and create a conspiracy that David was out to grab his throne. What changed? See, when you walk in Holy Spirit, you respond to God in every situation with people. When you don't walk in Holy Spirit, you react to every situation. I'll demonstrate it to you. You guys, you guys you're an intern? Where are you from? You're from, from this church? Okay, come over here. You, some of you have seen this uh, probably on Instagram. I've done this illustration. I absolutely love embarrassing people on the stage. Um, could, you, could you open this for me, please? So this, this is what happens. Open it completely. Uh, this is not going to be for me. This is for you. Let, let's stand a little bit, little bit further so that people can see where you are. And so just, just hold it. So I want you to notice this. This is your heart and this is your character. God will allow people in your life to come into your life whom you don't like. Sometimes people that are causing you trouble. Uh, let's just start with basic ones. Uh, your siblings who drive you crazy. Maybe some other people who drive you pretty much crazy. And God allows, it's called your enemies, your foes, people who don't believe in you maybe, people who undermine you. And the reason why God allows that is because these people, they do this to you. They pretty much, they, what they, they bump it to you. And, and they keep doing this. And the crazy part is they don't stop. And so, and guess what happens? Well, of course, you're irritated. You're upset. You're not happy. Now, if you are like Saul, you're like, well, I'm going to give you a little bit. And you start giving back to them. But the reason why the Lord allows enemies in your life or people who don't like you, people who you don't get along with, is because God sees that your heart is filled with some issues and these people, they expose. Now, what we do without the Holy Spirit is this, is we blame the people who bump into us. And we say, the reason why I am angry is because you make me angry. Until you were born, I was holy. With your appearance, you brought a demon of anger and you planted it inside of me. But in reality, I want you to put it out. If you come to the Holy Spirit and you, you put out all of your issues to the Lord, and this is what's going to happen. Hold it, please. Don't ruin my illustration. This is what's going to happen. When you get your issues resolved with the Lord, the only thing that people do is cause the uncomfort of bumping into you. But stuff don't come out. Why? Because the stuff already was dealt with with the Lord. If things come out, because it was there. I have a I have a brother when I lived with my parents I had this brother I still have him as, a, as my brother <laughs> but he just provoked me to anger oh my goodness I was like I was not myself around him and he would just do the things he would you know like your siblings they know how to get under your skin they spent enough time with you they like they got you they got you figured out he knew how to punch the right he always punched it in such a way I would position my cup and hold it I would say Lord I, I am not gonna be an angry person I'm gonna be a good person and there my brother came everything I mean just he just provoked me to anger and one time I remember it was at one gym we were all going together as a family because he had like jacuzzi and sauna and and like pool it was like 15 years ago long long time ago we just came to America and my parents could not sign the papers they couldn't figure something out and because they didn't speak English and my brother stood right in front of the the lady who was speaking English and my brother just embarrassed our whole family he refused to translate for my parents just stood there like and he said actually I don't speak English and I'm standing behind him I was like you Judas how dare you do that you embarrassing your family and I got so mad I stepped in translated and I remember we're going to dressing room I'm sitting in the toilet 
and I'm just like, I'm boiling inside against my brother. And I feel the still small voice of God. He says, Vlad, you're such an angry person. I said, God, how dare you say that? I have a crazy brother. If I wouldn't have a brother like that, I'm the nicest person on the planet. You know that. I'm a good man. My brother, he's the problem. If you get rid of my brother, my anger is done. And I remember, this is what I felt the Lord speak to my heart. He said, it's not your brother. He says, he only reveals the fact that you're angry. He didn't put that anger there. You always had it. You just did not know you had it until you had your brother. And if you keep on blaming your brother, I'll never help to get rid of it. And I remember right there in the bathroom is where the revelation came. I'm an angry man who needs deliverance, who needs repentance. But as long as I blame the person who bumps into me, God can't remove the stuff out. If you always blame, see, when you are filled with Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit helps you to take responsibility for what's coming out, not to try to fix the people who are bumping into you. God's job is not to fix them. God's job is to fix you. The Holy Spirit wants to fix what you filled with and He wants to empty that so that when they bump into you, now it's not going to be comfortable. You're not going to be singing hallelujah, praise God. You can be still be a little bit upset but you're not going to be reacting to them because you'll be responding to God. That's what being filled with Holy Spirit does. And lastly, I want you to write this down. Thank you so much for volunteering and putting yourself at risk. You will be mission-minded instead of ambition-driven. When the Holy Spirit came upon Saul, he wanted to save the city. When the Holy Spirit left Saul, he wanted to save his title. Let me say that again. When the Holy Spirit came upon him, he saved the city. When the Holy Spirit left him, his whole goal was to save his title in the kingdom. People without Holy Spirit are rank, title, and position obsessed. Take a title from them. It's the same thing as taking their liver and their kidney and half of their heart. Their whole world collapses. Remove them from a position of leadership. It destroys everything about them. Why? Because see people with Holy Spirit, they're mission driven. Without the Holy Spirit, they're ambition driven. And we as pastors, we know that. Sometimes a season comes and you ask the person, hey, you, you can't do this anymore. Um, you, you're going to have to serve in other areas. And you see they're going through a depression. And you say, what happened? This title doesn't define you. What defines you is your relationship with God. But without the Holy Spirit, you depend on the title. With the Holy Spirit, you depend on the calling to serve God. And whether it's on the stage or in the lobby or in the kids zone and in another country or in whatever face or whatever place it is, whether you get invited, you don't get invited, doors get open or not, you're like water. Looks for a smallest crack, gets out and finds a place to serve, finds a place to love people, finds a place to bless other people. Why? Because people filled with Holy Spirit, they don't need an open door. They need a crack and they'll serve. But when your Holy Spirit leaves your life, you hold on to a position as to your dear life. The rank, the title, Saul held on to the throne. But when the Holy Spirit was on him, he was obsessed with saving the city. When your heart is more attached to your position, it's a good reminder. You and the Holy Spirit are getting a little bit distant. He wants you to be close. That you're attached to his calling and your purpose not to the position and the influence and the open doors and the title or the rank you currently occupy amen i want us to rise to our feet if, if the wonderful worship team can come up What do you do if you lost that closeness with the Holy Spirit? What do you do 
if you are not filled with that Holy Spirit? Three things. One is you pay a price for being consistent. Number two, you stay small in your eyes. And number three, you focus more on repentance and less on relief. Saul didn't pay a price to be consistent. He started good. With time, he drifted from it. Saul became big in his eyes instead of remaining small. And thirdly, Saul, he always opted to entertainment instead of change. He had demons. He had problems. And instead of calling Samuel to deliver him, pray for him, he called a musician to entertain him. The real solution to your life is not getting a relief. It's repentance. Relief, and that's what many times our conferences and our church experiences here could offer. A sense of relief. And I, I know the feeling. It's kind of like when your car has a a light that comes up that says your gas tank is empty and you go to a mechanic and says could you replace the light bulb why this is bothering me the mechanic good mechanic will say that's not the real problem no you don't understand me I don't like Christmas lights on my dashboard remove the light that's relief but the real problem is not the light on the dashboard it's just a sign that you have a bigger problem your gas tank is empty and right now this is the two things could happen one is you can look for relief say Lord yeah I kind of feel a little conviction could you get rid of that conviction Jesus I'm so sorry but well, you say that sorry before or you can seek repentance repentance is not just tears it's not just brokenness repentance is saying Lord things have to change in my life my direction has to change how I live have to change and today I turn my life around and I follow you in Jesus name Father God, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your presence. And most importantly, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that is in this room. I thank you, Lord God, that nothing is impossible to you. And I thank you, God, that even our hearts, you're able to change. Lord, many of us relate more with Saul than we would like to admit today. Many of us, God, we spend our life living in balance, living cautious. A lot of times, God, we, we make deals with our enemies, Lord. We, a lot of us, God, today, we struggle with issues with authority. Some of us here, God, in this room today, we have a problem with people that constantly get on our nerves and we blame them for the way we react and the way we respond. And we think that they are the problem and they need to be fixed before we can change. And God, there are people even in this room who are so obsessed with titles, who are so obsessed with what people say about them, God, and we live our life pleasing people instead of serving them. And Lord, we recognize today that the root of all of that, Lord, is just that life that's not filled with the Holy Spirit. It's filled with opinions. It's filled with information. It's filled with church attendance. It's filled with good works, but it's not with your Spirit. And we would like to be today changed. We would like to come back to you, Lord, and see you change us from the inside out. Fill us with your Spirit, Lord. We empty ourselves from our pride. We empty ourselves from our self-sufficiency. We empty ourselves today, God, from our religiosity. We empty ourselves of our hypocrisy, God. One way that we are on the outside and the other way we live in private, God. We want to get real with you. Dear Holy Spirit, come into this room right now. From the back of the rows to the front, I ask you that you will examine our hearts. I ask you for those who maybe started like this, but today they recognize that their life drifted so far. They still know how to speak in tongues and maybe they still know how to say the right things, God. They still know how to raise their hands and say amen. They still have a Bible reading plan and a new version, but Lord, their life is so distanced. And today the things that we talk, God, they find themselves failing at each one of those things, God. Dear Holy Spirit, I ask you that you will draw people to the cross right now. I ask you right now that you will not offer us relief, but that you will give us the gift of repentance. We depend on you to help us to repent. We depend on you to help us change. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, come right now. Shift things in the atmosphere. Shift things in the hearts of people. Shift things in the lives of people. In Jesus' name. If you feel like one of these things, they apply to your life. And you find yourself today, not where you're supposed to be with God. And you may say, Vlad, you know what? This relates to me. 
I feel like I'm the person who I know about God but in this area is with authority in the area with people in the area with sin or maybe in the area of walking in boldness maybe it's in the area of walking in your mission instead of walking protecting titles that's me and today I would like to make a change with the help of the Holy Spirit I ask you that you come and you stand in the front and we're gonna pray with you if you're saying that this was for you the Holy Spirit spoke to you today that things need to be shifted and broken that you come that you come that you come and I ask you that you don't ask God to change the light bulb but ask the Lord to fill your gas tank ask the Lord to fill your gas tank empty yourself up of yourself right now say Lord I empty my life right now of my pride I empty my life of my falsehood and my hypocrisy my double standard I empty myself of that and I ask you that you fill me with your grace and that you fill me with your power that you fill me with your presence right now and that you fill me with the awareness of the spirit of the living God Precious Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh right now. If you're standing in the sanctuary, I'm assuming you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Your mouth better be moving. If you're standing there, I assume you're filled with the Spirit of God. Your mouth better be moving. Your hands better be up. Because you're the one that's filled. You better be releasing right now something in the atmosphere to help these precious souls to begin to experience the presence of God. To begin to experience a transformation in their heart. If you're standing there, I'm assuming you're filled with the Spirit. That means your mouth better be moving. Your mouth better be moving. Your heart better be bubbling right now. Right there where you're standing, your eyes closed. Your hands reach to heaven and begin to cry out the Spirit of God. Begin to cry out the Spirit of God. That you will touch them, God. That you will touch. Descend, Holy Spirit, right now. Descend, Holy Spirit, right now. Descend, Holy Spirit, right now. Holy Spirit, descend right now in the name of Jesus. Descend right now, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching this content. I know this was a blessing to you. We would like to ask you to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell on our channel so that each time we upload something, you can be notified. Don't forget to share this content with your friends and family and on social media. We're so thankful to you. Better is not good enough. The best is yet to come.